A little bit about me, I just graduated in May and I've been kind of struggling with the idea of law school for the past two years you know i i it's my goal i, I want to go to law school but uh, at the same time i'm not the best when it comes to standardized testings i've never been good at taking tests and my gpa is not like as high as it could be at the 3.45 um and i know and i know i need to uh, ace the lsat in order to get a, get a good scholarship so right. and uh, you know with my i've taken the lsat twice i uh, got a 151 the first time. And the second time I was so nervous, I, I went home and canceled the test because I knew I probably did the same or worse than my previous test. Um, but around four months ago, I decided to just really, really go for it this time and, you know, not take any time off between studying. And I've been studying about 32 hours a week consistently for the past three months. And so... I, I see an upward trend. I've gone from low 50s to mid 50s, but I feel like I've kind of hit a brick wall um, and I'm stuck on a 154. Sometimes I get a 155, but you know, sometimes I even go down. Um, last week I got a 153, which is mm -hmm. below my average. Um, so I don't know. I feel like I've kind of just plateaued and there's no way to go. Uh, there's no, there's no way I could go any higher. And my best section is LR. I usually get minus four, minus five. Um, I, I always ace the LR section. RC is not the best. Um, I'm not a native English speaker. I came to this country when I was 15. Um, so I'm not a, I'm not a fast reader. Uh, and I usually run out of time. When it comes to the last passage, I answer the first question, second question, maybe. And I have to guess on like five questions normally and lg is my worst section by far i usually get minus 11 minus 12 sometimes um for some reason when i do untimed sections you know i can get through a game without a problem but when it comes to a, a full timed section sometimes i freeze and i don't know what to do like i don't know how to diagram and i just waste so much time trying to figure out what kind of game it is like i make a diagram and i'm like oh it doesn't look good i have to scratch my diagram, start over, and I always run out of time. And sometimes I overlook very, very obvious um, inferences. And, you know, they cost me at the end. Yeah, no, it's great to hear the breakdown of what's going on for you. I can understand the struggles that you're facing. It sounds like the stress or anxiety of doing the full length test experience or even individual time sections could be getting to you. And so I'm wondering in part what you might be doing in terms of trying to mitigate that specifically in terms of mindfulness, meditation, relaxation, yoga, things in that general category, and then what you're doing in terms of your review process after the fact to pinpoint exactly what might have been holding you back and what your review process looks like. Um, so I did try meditating and it really does help. I, I remember in one of your videos, you mentioned it and I thought, you know what, why not give it a try? So before my, um, before my time section this morning, actually, I did 10 minutes of meditation nice. and it worked. It, it was amazing. It, it was wonderful. I was much more calm. Um, but then again, LR is my, my best section. So I'm, I'm not usually anxious when it comes to LR. Um, but when it comes to logic games, I think it, it has to do a lot with my confidence level because um, internally, I think that I'm terrible at games. So when it comes to solving a game, I have this voice in my head that tells me, you know what, you're not going to do well on games, you're not going to succeed, you're not, this is going to hold you back. So I'm wondering, um, and when it comes to prepping, like, I'm sorry, when it comes to reviewing, when I review my games, I see sort of a trend, I keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So maybe it's, uh, maybe my review method needs to change. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, if you keep making the same mistakes again and again, then it's definitely worth drilling down into specifically what those mistakes were, why they happened, if it's certain a certain game type, or if it's a certain habit, like misreading the rules, misdiagramming the rules, careless mistakes, like you said, like things like that. Maybe you need to slow down sometimes or double check things. And when it comes to like writing down the rules, right? Do you think it's better to spend as much time diagramming and making up scenarios, or is it better to like jump into the questions? 
and kind of try to figure out the game as you go along? It depends. Some games have a lot of inferences you can do up front. Others don't. When you right. can, it's fantastic, but not every game will lend itself to the that, especially the weirder curveball games. Some of the more recent ones actually tend less towards tons of upfront inferences and require doing more work over the course of the game. So you got to take a look to see if it's possible. And if not, move on and be okay with that. Be, be flexible knowing that there will still be methods to solve the questions. It just requires more work over the course of the game. Right. And um, in your course, you mentioned that some people, uh, when it comes to RC, they they go for three passages as opposed to four. Um, so I was I was wondering if that's something I should aim for since I barely have time to read all four passages. Um, and I kind of rush through the, the, the first three passages in order to get to the fourth one. And I tend to mess up a lot because I'm like in a hurry. I'm trying to finish it up as much as, as fast as I can. So I was wondering maybe if I go for three passages, then it, it would increase my accuracy. What do you think about that? What's your goal score? Um, like 159, 158 above. Okay. Um, I mean, it's possible that solving three passages thoroughly could be sufficient for you if you can get the games and logical reasoning up. Yeah. In particular, yeah. since you said that was a struggle area. Reading comp, yeah. I mean, you still got time to work on it too. And you just joined the course. There's a ton of resources on reading comp specifically. I have the deep dive classes I've been doing recently. I would suggest you work through those and see if that might change something about your approach. Yeah. Um, so I, I have about six weeks left. I'm taking the January LSAT. And that's another thing. So if I, let's say, don't get my desired score in January, do you think I should take the February test or just wait until next the next cycle? Well, if you take the February LSAT, I would probably suggest you wait until next cycle. I recommend that January be the latest. Could February, could February be okay? Maybe. But odds are a little bit lower at that point in the cycle. There's less scholarship money available. And so if you can't get where you want to be by January it might be worth retaking and then applying next cycle. Got it, got it. And when it comes to like applying to law schools, um, I, I, I have a list of 23 law schools that I'm interested in, but I need to narrow that list to maybe about 15 because um, I don't want to apply to 23 law schools. Um, so what criteria should I look at besides, let's say their median GPA, their median LSAT? Um, and oh, how far would you say the median should be from what my score and my GPA is? Should I just go for it? The, the ones that I fall into the, the 50th percentile or maybe, you know, go, go for the ones that I'm a little above uh, their average. So what's your approach on that? Well, my, my approach probably isn't that different from what most other people would suggest. I'd say, look, but don't just think about medians specifically. You have to also look at your soft factors to see if that might make you a relatively stronger candidate in certain ways. And then I would also cast a wide net. I mean, 15 schools is fine. I'm curious why you said not 23, though. Not that I'm suggesting you should do 23, but why not? I mean, I feel like it's it's maybe too it may be too much because I I've heard that most people apply to maybe nine or ten. Uh, so 23 compared to nine is like whoa. <laughs> All depends on your goals. All depends on your goals. How important it is to you to maximize the opportunities you have available to you. Right. Right. So if it's if you were going to say to me like. I don't want to spend that much on application fees. I have a really, really tight budget for application fees. That is a reasonable consideration. But, or if it's just that you don't want to do that many applications and certain schools have unique essays you'd have to write separately, which they typically don't, that might have been another consideration. But let's just say you're going for 15. You could do five target, five safety, five reach. So target would be where you're right around the median. Safety would be a little bit above the median, reach would be a little bit below the median, where Got you're it. a little bit below the median. And so if you want to maximize chances, apply to more safety schools. If you want to maximize opportunities, maybe you want to apply to more reach schools, depending if you want to pu punch a little bit above your numbers. Safety schools, more scholarship money likely, reach schools, less scholarship money, but maybe higher rankings, maybe better employment outcomes. Employment outcomes is something I would look at Meaning, so you go on a site, you look at their 509 reports that they submit right. to the ABA covering 
what percentage of graduates have a, a job requiring a JD nine months after graduation. You could go on law school transparency to look up employment stats. They break down a lot of the 509 report data simply and beautifully with graphs and such can make it easier to interpret. Those are the kinds of thing that's, things I'd be looking for. Got it. Thank you, Steve. And my last question is regarding my personal statement. So my life has had a lot of, has had lots of ups and downs. Um, I, I was, you know, I, I've lived in multiple areas of the world and that hasn't been an easy path for me. So when it comes to writing my personal statement, I've, I have two, ver two different versions and they are very different. I mean, one makes me seem, um, in one of them, I take sort of a, a victim approach um, where, I, where I tell how I've been victimized and how um, traveling a lot as a refugee and you know, living in different parts of the world temporarily has affected me mentally and how I've kind of lost touch with my true identity. And the other one, I, I sort of explain how it's made me realize that I'm different and being different is not, you know, a terrible thing. So which approach do you think law schools appreciate more? Definitely the latter. I mean, I don't like the idea of a victim approach specifically. You can include those details, but then you also want to show what you've learned from these experiences, how you've grown from these experiences, how you may have encountered many struggles along the course of your life up to this point, but then to show some kind of triumph or success you've had afterwards, what you've learned from the experience, that alone really. like Failure is fine, difficulties are fine, challenges are fine, but you also want to end on an uplifting note if possible. Or Got maybe it. it's possible to include some details in a diversity statement or in an addendum and then include others in the main personal statement. And by the way, we're running law school application essay workshops fairly frequently inside the course. I've run about 10 of them already. And so if you ever want to submit your drafts, I can add them to the agenda for an upcoming Absolutely. workshop. Yeah, that would be wonderful. And um, I see that we have one minute left, so I'm going to make this quick. Um, it's regarding the diversity statement. I've sort of explained how I bring diversity in my personal statement. So, and I don't want to sound repetitive. So how do you think I should go about writing a diversity statement when my personal statement is about how I bring diversity? As long as you're covering different details and different themes. Okay. But it's all about the details though. It sounds like if you've already written a diversity statement, then maybe if you wanted to include other details that could go into an optional essay, like a separate third essay altogether. And do you think it's a good idea to include what concentration I want to go for in my personal statement? Like, I'm very interested in environmental law. Do you think I should include that? You can. Depends to what extent it might tie back with other things you've covered in the statement. It's not required. It's nice to have, but I would aim to tie it together thematically in some way. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Of course, Iman. Great connecting with you. I'll see you in class soon. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.